so we're in chapter 3 talking about what? What is, this, what is the entire discussion that we've been going over for the past few weeks? Should I start giving quizzes again? Yeah, actually, I want to they take time to make, man. Otherwise, I wouldn't mind doing them. Yeah, take them quizzes. Yeah. Huh? The dunya. The dunya, right. So he, uh, Imam Ghazali, rahimahullah ta'ala, he's been talking about the dunya and our relationship to it. Uh, so what, today we're going to talk about a description of the world and its reality in regards to the rights of the servant. So in regards to the rights of the abd, uh, he'll discuss a little bit of what that means and how our viewpoint and our, how our vantage should be concerning the dunya, how we view it, um, and is it, is it all bad? Um, and I think that's an important discussion. So here, he says, knowing the world is not enough if you do not understand the reality of this world and that it is cursed. And this is something that he has specified time and time again, uh, something that is extremely important. When he talks about the dunya, when he talks about this world, it is something that is accursed. Uh, he says it is important to understand what to avoid and what not to, and we must clarify what elements of this world are cursed and what must be avoided, as it is a clear enemy blocking your path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in summary, what is it? He says here that uh, in regards to the heart, it's very similar to how we view, or how, w like, it's, it's very similar to what the reality of the world is and the next world is. So when we talk about the dunya and when we talk about the akhirah, these two are very close in terms of how they should manifest in an individual's heart. Meaning that if there's more world, worldliness, what's going to happen? It's going to affect my heart. And if I strive more for the akhirah, if I strive more for the next world, it's also going to have an effect on my heart. So he's saying here, very similarly, before anything that happens before death is this world. And anything that happens after death is, is the next world. And he says that it is this balance that makes the difference on how our heart should be and how our attitude should be. So if my heart leads more toward the next world, my outlook is going to be, is going to be different, right? And if I only lean toward this world, it's going to be different and it's possible to, and, and here, does Ghazali want us to have a balance? Like we, we've been talking about a balance the whole time. Is it, should I have a balance between this world or in the next world? Is that what he's saying? And I want you guys to think about the answer. Okay, no? Yes? Yes? Okay. Right, so that, it, it's an interesting point. So Uthman, he said that use this world for the next. And we'll, we'll talk about Ghazali's definition on what he, what he means by that. But if you actually look to what Ghazali talks about, he said that our entire focus should be here. Our entire focus should be in the next life. And he'll talk about this, what you were discussing. So here, before death, he's saying, is everything bad? No, and there are three types. So basically, if we divided before death into three types of things, the first of them would be the things that follow you, right, after you die. And I'm sure some of you are aware of some, what are some of the things that follow us after death? Right, sadaqa, our deeds, right? He divides them into two major categories. He says knowledge and actions. Um, and he says the knowledge and action, these are the two things that actually follow us after we pass and after we die. Then he says that there are things that are in this world only that are immediate. Right, al-ajil. And he says from these things are like loving sin, uh, extravagance, and indulgence. All of these things, what do you guys think? Like, there's some people who love sin. There's some people who love zina. There's some people who love drinking alcohol. There's some people who love lying and cheating and backbiting. Right, there are people who love those things. Um, those things are clearly, clearly problematic. And those that are between the two. So here he mentions needs. So needs, what does he mean by that? Needs. Right? Food, clothing, shelter. Like these are all needs that we have. Um, and he also mentions means. Now this is what Uthman was talking about. What, is, what do we mean by means? So those are things that we need in and of themselves, right? I need food, clothing, and shelter to survive. By means, what is he talking about? What does he intend? Okay, I'm sorry, I heard like three people speak at the same time. Huh. Go ahead. Huh. Yeah. Oh, okay. The, to, to, the, the means to what? Yes. 
Uh. Okay. Uh, the means to this. The means to needs. Okay. Anyone else? Huh? Money? Money is a means, for sure. So, which one of these three is problematic? If we just look at these three here, which one is clearly problematic? The immediate, right? So this one is the one that is problematic. Uh, and what is a way to be sure to be safe? So which one do you guys agree that is not problematic and that we should, right? The, the, the things that follow you. So we should definitely focus on knowledge and action. Saying that, how do I make sure that these are safe? by making it a means to what? For knowledge and action. Yes? So, you're saying that like, knowledge that I have in this world mm -hmm. will fall into that. Why? So let's, let's talk about knowledge. I think that's an excellent question. When we say knowledge, what do we mean? Okay, so no knowledge of the Sharia, yes. Okay. Okay. So it's not only am I protecting myself, but I'm helping others as well. So th that's what we mean by knowledge. Because the more knowledge I have, the more what I can be? The more arrogant I can be? <laughs> Allah Akbar. Huh? Ah, the closer to Allah I can be, the better actions and more fulfilling I can have. Like if, is there a difference between someone who knows how to pray and who doesn't know how to pray? Right, there's a clear difference. Someone who knows how to give sadaqah and someone who doesn't. Someone who knows the rights of marriage and husn al-ashira and knows how, like, how to live properly with their spouse. Right, having that knowledge base, what happens? Hmm? Right, it strengthens, it strengthens your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It also strengthens our relationship with who? Oh, with the people around us. Right, the more knowledgeable I am, the more this should be expressed in my relationships around me. Right, if, if I know that the people around me have rights, I'm going to do my best to what? Right? To, to make sure that they're being fulfilled. But if I don't know their rights, can I do that? Right? It, bec it becomes much more challenging. It becomes much more difficult. So uh, th I think this is uh, it's a very important point here. And he'll, he'll mention some specific examples because you still, you still seem a little... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Be because even here, uh, and let me put another aspect to it, another vantage point to it. Seeking knowledge is what? No, no, not just required. Not just encouraged. It, while I'm seeking knowledge, I'm doing what? It's a form of worship. It's a form of worship. Right? It's a type of worship. And in every type of worship, I'm getting rewarded. And, and, the, and the thing is, the, the unique thing about knowledge, like, so seeking knowledge versus fasting. Right? So if I have a choice between, for example, seeking knowledge or fasting Mondays and Thursdays, Mondays and Thursdays, I'm not really good with fasting, Right, so I, I decide to seek knowledge. Which one is better? Seeking knowledge, right? Seeking knowledge is better, why? Uh, because it benefits me and others. Fasting benefits who? It only benefits myself. It only benefits myself. So that, that's one of the reasons that knowledge is, uh, has superiority. Not just that, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he described the scholar and the worshiper, how did, he how did he describe them? He said the scholar is like what and the worshiper is like what? Uh, he said the scholar is like the moon and the worshiper is like the stars. They're both beautiful. But which one is clearly more beautiful? The moon. Also, uh, so what does knowledge mean? It means knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, knowing his angels, books, messengers, uh, knowing that he, Azza wa Jalla, is the one that owns everything, uh, and also knowing the sharia of the messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Uh, and again, these things are beneficial knowledge. Also, actions, those actions or those acts of worship that are sincerely and sincere in seeking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's face and seeking his pleasure. Uh, so a scholar, he might become so engrossed in knowledge that he prefers it over eating, drinking, right? He might even prefer it over intimacy. He might prefer it over sleeping. Why? Engrossed. Engrossed is, yani mustaghraq. Hmm. Why? Why did he get to that point? 
curiosity might have started it. Because he enjoys it. He, he, he loves it, right? So an individual, he becomes so engrossed in this, he loves it. He loves seeking knowledge. He loves reading. He loves building his knowledge base. He loves learning more about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The more he learns about Allah, the more what? He, wa- he wants to learn. Yes. Mm. Sure. So, but when we say not leaving off, what does that mean? Hmm? Mm. Don't leave it off absolutely. Like, don't just stop sleeping. Huh? Don't just stop eating. Don't just stop, you know. If, if I leave these things time and again, and it's not causing harm to my, my body, myself, and to others, have I done anything wrong? No. Even he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he, there was a very common practice of his. He used to practice wisal. Do you, do you guys know what that is? He used to continuously fast, like for days at a time. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Um, and why was he able to do that? Because you know, there are two understandings. Uh, one of them is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him the spiritual strength that he was actually able to carry on and able to do that. Or the other one is that it was, it was prophetic and it was, a mir- it was miraculous for him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So we're allowed to do things as long as they are not harming us. If they're not harming us, we can continue to do that. And I mean, how many of us have been in a situation, like, for example, like, I'll give a very modern, clear example. When you have an exam, sometimes what do you do? Huh? You stay up all night, right? You stay up all night studying. Like, is that your habit? No, right? It's not something that you do every single night. And it's the same thing with scholar. Uh, what happens is that many times they'll get caught up in a particular issue, or they want to research something, or they want to find out more about something. So what happens? The whole night will pass, and they what? They don't even feel it. They don't even realize, you know, what had happened. There, there are many times, like, you know, subhanAllah, man, like, <laughs> even some of my teachers, they'll stop to read something, and they'll, like, forget that they were standing. You know what I mean? Like, they're just so engrossed in, in an issue that they forget what they're doing, and they're just sitting there just reading, like, marking up, making notes. Um, so, it, it, and it does happen. It's something that is definitely, it's, it's real. And he's saying here that this, this seeking knowledge um, it is something that Imam Ghazali says is part of the next world. And I'll talk, uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more of why he feels that and why that is. Uh, so here he also gives the example of the worshiper. Right? Is it possible a worshiper becomes so engrossed in his worship, a person is so busy in their salah that they don't even realize there are other people around them? Right? It's definitely. It, it definitely can happen. Right? A person is just so focused and so engrossed that they, they don't even realize that there are other people around them. Um, here, he says, some of them went to the extent saying, I do not fear death except that will prevent me from my night prayer. Right? This, this worship had become so beloved to him that this was the only thing that he was worried about. He said, others said, oh Allah, provide me the strength to pray, bow and prostrate in my grave. Why? Because they loved praying so much. Uh, he saw them said, it has been made beloved to me from your worldly affairs, fragrances and women, and the coolness of my eyes is in the prayer. So here, uh, there are a few things. There are many benefits that are here. The first of them is what? Hubbiba ilayya min dunyakum. That it has been made beloved to me from your worldly affairs. And the, and the wording is interesting, right? How he saw them actually said that. He says that what has been made beloved, what has been made beloved to me from your worldly affairs, what is he doing? He, he's kind of what? He's, like, he's kind of distancing himself, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He didn't say what? Hmm? Hmm. He, or he didn't just, just simpler. What is a simpler way to say the sentence? I love. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is the easiest way to say it. Like, I love fragrances and women. Isn't, is that not an easier way to say that? They, there are a few reasons that he didn't say it. One of them was he, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, was actually distancing, distancing himself to show that he, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, was not what? But he's not attached. He's not worldly. Right? That's something that's really important. Also, if he came forward and he said that, like, I love fragrances and women, how does that sound? Right? It sounds kind of creepy, right? It's kind of, it's kind of vulgar. Right? It's, a, it's a bit vulgar when, when you say it, so it's, it's kind of crass 
to, to print, present it in that way. So he saw Islam presented it in a nice way, and he said, and he closed it by saying, and He said, and the coolness of my eyes has been made in the prayer, showing that his true love is what? Is salah, right? His true love is salah, and he, even though it is something that is practiced in this world. Uh, so the reasons that Imam Ghazali says that these actions are included in this world is because this is the world that we perceive and that we experience. And that's the only part of it that is actually considered to be from this world. But the reality is that because the reason that these actions are being performed are what? Are they being performed in this world? No. Because they're being performed for the next, they're actually counted as as a means to the next world. And this is why Imam Ghazali, he doesn't put them in actions of this world. He puts them in the actions of, of the next world. Because even the benefit for those things, I mean, are there benefits in prayer in this world? Right, like what? In the Salat? Huh? Tanha in al-fahshai wal munkar. Right, that the prayer, it prohibits an individual. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Zakhla khair. So it prevents you from fahish in munkar, right? It prevents you from doing evil actions and evil deeds, right? So this is one of the purposes of prayer. Um, and so there is some dunya we benefit for it, but ultimately, why is it done? It's done for the next world. Um, so he's saying that all things in this world are cursed except what now? Except the kir, right? Except those things that are done for the next. Uh, so he says there are things that which have no fruit in the next life. So we had mentioned three categories. This is the second one. Uh, he's saying that loving sin, indulgence, extravagance, and gold, silver, horses, cattle, farm, you know, castles, big homes, nice cars, whatever it might be. Um, and, and he says that these are things that are unnecessary. These are things that are unnecessary, and they require a deep reflection. Why? Uh, right? Are these things always bad? No. Uh, uh, so, when, so over here you're saying that it's a conditional problem. That it's a problem when? Right, if that's my goal. Right, if my goal is the nice car. If my goal is the nice house. If my goal is the nice job. Right, all of those things are fine, but I have to what? Be cognizant that I'm doing it when? Huh? Why am I doing these actions? And this is where it's important to make sure that we have right intention. Yeah. Right. Be, at the end of the day, if these are facilitating and drawing me nearer and making me a better Muslim and bringing me closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then I have used these tools successfully. And if I'm just busy focusing on those tools, then I have used them unsuccessfully. You know, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us successful. I mean... Uh, so here, Omar radiallahu anh, he appointed Abu Darda to Homs. Uh, Homs is, uh, what is it in English? I forgot what Homs is in English. Yeah, please. Um, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. Yeah. Huh? Aleppo, Ahsant. Yes, it is. That's exactly what it is. Uh, so, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll update this, inshallah. But Omar appointed Abu Darda to Homs, or Aleppo, and Abu Darda had erected a fence for cattle and spent two dirhams on it. Omar radiallahu anh, he heard of this and wrote to him from Omar ibn Khattab, Amir al-Mu'mineen, to Awaymir. And this was like a type of way of making him small. Uh, and he said, there is enough worldly adornment for this lifetime in the examples of the Persians and Romans before Allah destroys it. If this letter reaches you, then proceed with your family to Damascus. So Abu Darda, then he went on to Damascus, and he died uh, in Damascus, seeing that all that he had left behind was unnecessary and extra. And he said, فتأمل. And Imam uh, Ghazali, he says, ponder over this. So there are a few ways to understand this. What, what, is, what is one understanding that you guys took from this? Uh, he's checking him for sure, right? He's definitely checking him. There's no doubt. What else? I mean, he was just—you know—I mean, he was just making a small cattle. You know, he wanted to 
keep, keep some sheep or goats. Yeah, so why? why? All right, prioritizing leadership. Like, because the thing is, as a governor, you're getting what? You're already getting a stipend. So now, if you start a farm, what are you trying to do? You're trying to make more money. And as a governor, if you have other businesses, what happens? Ah, you have a conflict of interest. So, not just that, I might have said, hey, listen, you were in, I mean, you were, you were in bliss. You, like, you've already seen what the Romans had. You've seen what the Persians had. What did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ultimately do to it? Right, he destroyed it. So what do you think you're, what kind of kingdom do you think you're going to be building with this, <laughs> you know, with this, uh, with this cattle that you have going on here? Uh, so, and then there's what is between the two. So we said that there is immediate, right, those things which are done exclusively for this world, and then there are those things that are done for the next world, and then there's between the two. So he says there are a few things, like, for example, the minimum amount of food for sustenance, right? I need to eat what will sustain me. Uh, he also says... <laughs> Yeah, you gotta love Ghazali. Uh, he says, <laughs> one harsh piece of clothing. And he said, all of those needs required to reach knowledge and action. So like books, sitting with teachers, traveling, you know what I mean? Like, so all of those are definite means of uh, reaching knowledge and stuff. Uh, wh what do you guys think about this? Yes, it's tough. Uh, extreme? I mean, you gotta love Ghazali, man. Yes. Mm -hmm. And my understanding is that uh, uh, knowledge doesn't necessarily inform action. And in uh -huh. the Quran, we yeah. specifically have ten months for the confirmation of mm -hmm. Elam and Amma. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. So, uh, but here he doesn't talk about ten months, but I don't know. To me, like, uh, they are separate. So, I mean, the thing is, you have, you have multiple attributes, right? So, you have Helm. You have hikmah, you have sabr, right? All of these, he's, he's kind of encompassing in, in, in short, shortening them into these two issues, right? Because you have knowledge, which is the information, then you have acting upon that knowledge, which is some of these things. So hikmah is actually, what, what is hikmah? Hikmah is knowing when to act on knowledge, right? So it, it, it's a man, yeah. and not everyone has it. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no I, I agree, uh, 100%. But saying that, like, that's more of a manifestation of knowledge, like even sabr. Sabr is a manifestation of knowledge. Um, but these are all, if, at the end of the day, they're all actions. So the thing is, like, in general, I don't, I don't really have a big issue with the categorization that, that he's put forward because it's not meant to be exhaustive. Uh, so what do you guys think about the one, one harsh piece of clothing? It's pretty harsh. <laughs> but why do you think he mentioned this? Huh? No, no Gucci? Why not? I, I, I want to be bougie, man. So it's not required for knowledge, but again, remember, what is Ghazali trying to do? He's, try, he's trying to create that baseline. And he, he's basically saying that you should be able to get to scale back to a point that what? That you need to be, you, yes, that you, you know what the bare minimum is. Because the moment I get to that bare minimum, I can truly understand what it is that I need. Right? And, and I can learn to appreciate those things that I have. So if I cut back on my meal, or if I make my meal simpler, right, and I cut back to very simple pieces of clothing, I might be in a setting where those things, you know, subhanAllah. And I'll just give one example. I have, uh, there's one brother I know, he, he flips houses, right? That's what he does, like, as a business. So he went and he bought, like, a really nice car. And I was like, bro, fear Allah, why would you get such a nice car? Blah, blah, blah. He's, like, he's like, listen, man, if I show up in my minivan to sales, he said, people don't respect me. So I was like, fair enough. Everybody goes through different challenges. Everybody goes through different states. Everybody goes through different types of presentation. And that, that needs to be understood that just because we're talking about a theoretical bare minimum, is that a practical bare minimum? No, not necessarily. For some people, can this lifestyle work? Yeah, for sure, 100%. But is it applicable to most people? No. The idea, again, the idea is learn to strip back, learn to really you know, scrape down to the bare minimum so that we can learn who we are. 
And the moment that we learn who we are, we can reset that baseline and adjust our gauges. And even gauges, they constantly need what? Adjustment. So every, every once in a while, it's good to kind of like remind ourselves. Every once in a while, hey, sit down, eat plain white rice. Why? To remind myself of all the food that tastes good and all the blessings that we have. Or just bread or fast. You know what I mean? Just don't eat and see how that feels. So there, there are different ways uh, for this to manifest. And again, this idea of scaling back, it's, it's something that's really important so that we learn to set that bare minimum. Uh, so why are these not considered actions of this world? We already answered this. Uh, because they're a means. And we said that anything that is used as a means to achieve the next world is also considered to be part of the next world. And every time an individual engages in worship or every time an individual uh, seeks knowledge, he's not actually engaging in this world. He's not consuming, right? He's not becoming a part of this world. He's still working for the next. Um, and what if it's something that is halal, but it doesn't make him more muttaqi? It doesn't make him more aware of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, then it's considered from the next, from this world. Eh, sure. If it's something that doesn't help him, if it's not used as a means, then it is what? It is from this world. And there's an interesting discussion that he gets into. So, uh, in, in, in regards to the heart and after we die, there are three very important things. He says there's purity of the heart, there's satisfaction in remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the third is loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these things are very important that we learn to have these characteristics of our hearts before we pass away. So he says purity of the heart, it's leaving off desires of this world. He said that, that is how we keep our hearts pure. And having satisfaction and remembering Allah, it's mean we have to keep doing dhikr. Right? We have to keep remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And by doing that, it's a way that we will finally penetrate our hearts and it will become beloved to us. And loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how do I do that? By pondering over him, by learning about him. Azza wa Jal. Right? And there are different ways to do that. I can do it by taking his name, Azza wa Jal, right? Or I can remember him in my heart, or a combination of the two. But these are all different ways to engage with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ways to draw near to Him, to make sure that these actions become beloved to me and so that I become a better Muslim and I become more aware. So these three actions are the keys to success. This is, this is how he describes them. He calls these the munjiyat. He said, essentially, these are the three things that every single Muslim must do in order to be successful. Yeah. Uh, he also mentions here that righteous actions work as a shield between uh, ourselves and between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's punishment. And he mentions a hadith that when an individual enters his grave and he is a believer, his deeds surround him, the prayer and fasting. And an angel approaches him from the side of his prayer, yani the deeds that he had did, and it repels him. And then from the side of his fasting and it repels him, meaning that this angel was an angel of what? Of punishment, right? This is an angel of punishment, but the deeds are actually protect him. Um, so, this dhikr, and this remembrance, it is meant to be a vehicle and a means to draw near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's something that's really important. That these, are, these also are spiritual tools that we use to draw near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, and the more, the closer we get to death, the more we hope to meet Allah, the more we hope to see Allah Azza wa Jal. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all a good end. Ameen. And these are things that, while death is something that is scary, while death is something that is frightful, one of the things that we should hope for and look forward to is meeting our Lord Azza wa Jal. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us all to meet Him Azza wa Jal and grant us His the beatific vision. So, how can it not be so? when he loves except but one. So this is a question that Ghazali poses. He says that if an individual, all he loves is one, then what else is he going to do except try to achieve him, Azza wa Jal? He says that this world for that person is like a prison. And the only thing from pre preventing him from meeting his beloved is what? 
Huh? Right? It's, it's death, right? It's dunya. Like the dunya is the only thing that's stopping him. And in order to escape the dunya, he needs to what? He needs to die. Because it is in that death that he's going to meet him, Azza wa Jal. Why? Because now his path has finally been opened. So, he says, just like the one who seeks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is tortured by living in this world, he said, well, it's not very different from the one who seeks this world, right? He's, he's constantly tortured because he, say, he chases this world and what happens? Right? It, it, it's fleeting. And he, he's never actually able to what? To achieve it. So, he says that the reason that this person fears death is because he can't go back and what? Ch chase, the <laughs> chase the dunya some more. Uh, so, what is the state? Uh, he brings a piece of poetry. He says, what is the state of the one who only loves one when that one is hidden from him? All right, and the only thing that he's trying to achieve is him, Azza wa Jal. So, uh, for those sisters who are trying to convince their husbands to keep only one wife, this might be a piece of poetry you want to keep with you. <laughs> Death is a temporary state and only an abandonment for the one who favors this world. It's the first step toward approaching Allah, Azza wa Jal. I'm sorry? It's not convincing? Let's try, get one first, man. <laughs> but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, it, it's, it's important to understand his, his makana in our hearts and his, his position in our hearts. Because if we truly love him, Azza wa Jal, we will make all of our actions for him. We will make sure that we're doing everything we can to please him. We're going to make sure everything that we do with the individuals around us is to please him. What do we call that? Huh? I'm sorry? We call it taqwa. So when we talk about a constant awareness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He Azza wa is the one who's filling our hearts, then we're going to be aware. And, and you know, just, just imagine if we were in a constant state of awareness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how much more fulfilling our prayers would be, how much more fulfilling our interactions would be, how much lower our expectations would be from others, and how much higher our expectations would be from Him, Azza wa Jal. And, and this is important, because it, it helps create a lot of these dynamics and these relationships that we have with one another, if I put Allah first and foremost. Because I, if I put Him for, first, everything else is what? Secondary. And, it's not, it's, and ultimately, it's not important. And I don't mean that in a negative way or in a bad way, but it helps give me perspective when I'm dealing with others and I'm dealing with my life and even the difficulties and the hardship that we face if I know that I'm going through this difficulty if I know that I can't pay rent if I know that I have a bad relationship if I know that I'm stuck in something what will give me solace? the fact that I'm eventually I'm going to meet my Lord so what are the characteristics of the sadik of the seeker? he brings three he says that he does dhikr this is one he says that the, he does fikr Right, he ponders. And lastly, what do you think is the third one? Is that enough just to do dhikr and fikr? Right, he needs amal, actions. He says these things are very important and this is the way of the salik. This is the one who seeks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That these are the characteristics that he must have if he wants to be successful. So none of these characteristics can be achieved except by depriving oneself of this world. Why? Because when we scale back, and when we peel back, and when we get to the razor edge, we truly understand the value of this world. Because if I can learn to live with little to nothing, what kind of perspective does that give me? I'm sorry? Qana. So it gives me satisfaction, for sure. Why? Because I, at that point, I learned that what? I don't really need it. Um, the only thing that matters, you know, the only thing that matters is Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. So if I'm able to peel back all of this and I'm able to live on the bare minimum, it truly gives me perspective on the value of this world, and that it's really not that important and it's really not that valuable. So there are important perspectives to keep in mind when we do talk about these things. First, that this is not possible without being healthy, right? So if I want to worship Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, I also need to be healthy, right? If I'm sick. Right? or I have some kind of illness or disease, D will I worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as attentively as if I was healthy? No, probably not. 
right? Because I'm gonna be so worried about my headache, or I'm gonna be worried about my runny nose, I'm gonna be distracted in different ways. And, and all of us have been in that situation, you know, where, where we're standing and praying and my nose is constantly running. So am I, am I focused on the prayer or am I worried about like my snot dripping, right? Like, <laughs> like you know, like, so, so these, these, are, these are problems that we've all faced. And, but if I was healthy, that's one, thi- one less thing for me to worry about. So it's important, you know, to be healthy. And in order to be healthy, what do I need to do? I have to dress well and I have to live well. Because that's how I will. If, I, if I'm wearing dirty clothes, why is that a problem? Because I can get sick, right? Th- th- those clothes are going to carry disease. And if I'm not living well, right, if I live in a slum or if I live next to a polluted, you know, a polluted spot, again, I'm going to get sick. So it's important that I live well. It's important that I eat well. It's important that I dress well because I want to be healthy. Why do I want to be healthy? So I can worship better and I can have a more fulfilling worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah. Keep it, keep it clean. And it, it, It's harsh so your hands will get... So if an individual takes from these three, if he does fikr and dhikr and amal, um, as it means to the next, then essentially Ghazali says he's not really from this world. Why? Because he's, done, he's doing everything for the next. So he mentioned that before, right? He's only, me- he's only in it because this is our experience. And this is the world that we perceive. So our existence, yes, we exist here, but, but we're actually building ourselves for what? For the akhirah and for the next world. Uh, he says here that the world is nothing more than a garden for him to cultivate the next life with. And I, I thought this example in this, uh, this idiom was really beautiful. Uh, he said if he takes from it only to take advantage of the blessings in it, then he is of this world and he seeks its fortune. So he says that the only person who will succeed with this garden is if he's growing the fruits in it for, for the next one. But if I'm growing the fruits from it for me to benefit from, then I'm from this world. So he says here, the seeker, he deserves punishment if he is seeking haram. And he says, if he's seeking halal, what happens is he extends his accountability. And this one, this one's a bit tough. If it's haram, you're going to get punished. (laughs) Accountability is hisab, right? Meaning that my scrolls are going to get longer. And how does, he, how does he deal with this? And how does he talk about this? It's actually really interesting. So he says that, why is seeking halal an issue? He says that because it can extend your accountability, right? The more things that I acquire, the more I'm going to be what? I'm going to be responsible and accountable for. It makes sense. And he also says that it can, not just that, it can lower your status in paradise. Why? Because I didn't busy myself as much with, with Allah in the next world. So he's saying that in two ways, this is actually a type of punishment that I myself am increasing my accountability and I'm also tempting myself into falling into extravagance and indulgence. I'm sorry? How do you become bougie? I just hang out with me. I, I, got, I, got, I got you. Man. That's a different class. <laughs> so it's similar to the one who sees his peers acquiring worldly goods and the happiness associated with that. So basically he, he paints a picture here saying that, okay, hey, if you see one of your friends become successful, you start feeling a kind of way, right? Right, like they, they're, they're growing, they're becoming successful, and they're moving on. He's saying, okay, okay what if that's paradise? You know, what if I'm, I'm, I'm sitting there, and I got like, you know what I mean? I got like level two, you know, Mel Espano thought I enter us all into his paradise. I mean, but I got level two, and then all of a sudden, man, I see, I see Miguel, man, he's like level six. I'm going to feel some kind of way, and why, why did that happen? Is because I, all I had to do was what? I had to remove that attachment that I had from, from the dunya. No, there's no jealousy in that sense. But the thing is, when, when the hisab is happening, right? When the accountability is happening, is there not a sense of remorse that is shared by mankind? Absolutely. So he says that, in, in subhanAllah, he kind of takes it to the next level. He said that, okay, hey, this jealousy that happens in this world when we see other people succeed, he said this is actually something that we can comprehend and something that our minds can like, kind of encompass. He says, what about paradise? Something the mind can't even comprehend. Like how much greater would that, would that loss feel? Right? Like we, we, can, we can kind of comprehend that loss and we can measure it and scale it in this world. Well, what about a space that is immeasurable and is infinite and is vast? You know, how much more would that remorse be? 
Uh, so here he says, <laughs> you gotta love Ghazali, man. He says, for every church a trip of a bird that is enjoyed, looking at the beauty around us, or even drinking cold water, then these are all means from lowering our rank in the next world of the off, multitudes. And he uses a hadith, he says, uh, as he saw some said to Omar, this cold water is from the blessings you will be asked about. <laughs> and Omar became anxious, right, when he, when he heard the Prophet ﷺ said this. So he responded saying, Rem- remove me, remove from me its accountability. Like, I don't, I don't want to be accountable for it. And even though he was thirsty, and he was offered cold water and honey. So what, what he did is he took it in his hand, right, he kind of mixed it, and then he was like, never mind. Why? Ah. Uh. This is, why? Why is there accountability there? All right, so what, why mention cold water? Like, I think that's important. Right, so cold water is a luxury. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, I mean, today. Cold water is a luxury. So here, was he saw someone prohibiting him? No. What was he doing? Or was he giving him perspective? So it's important to keep that in mind when, when we talk about such a hadith. Is it meant to be like, so I don't want you guys going home and being like, no, lukewarm water for me only, right? Like, <laughs> that, <laughs> hot water. <laughs> it's like, oh, no, that's tea, can't have that. So like, it, it's important to kind of keep that perspective when, when we talk about these things and understand the context and, and when they lived. And, and also for us to understand what luxuries are so that we can truly put them in perspective so that we can benefit from them appropriately. That's all. You know, that's all this hadith is talking about. Uh, so he said, this world, all of it, whether it's permissible or impermissible, is cursed if it is not within condition that it is, does not aid to drawing nearer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, why? Because when we said that anything that is connected to Allah is not of this world. And the more awareness that we have, the more wary we will be. Uh, there are a couple of narrations that he mentions. He said, Isa alayhi salam, he slept on a rock, so like he took a small rock to rest his head on. And then he threw it afterwards when Iblis appeared to him and said, you became pleased with this world. Uh, so Iman, he used to feed the people delicious food while he himself would eat wheat bread. I mean, wheat bread's, I like wheat bread, so. He placed his kingdom at the same level as a test and a hardship, having forbearance with the luxuries of this world while having access to them is far more difficult. And this is an important point. Can I claim that, you know, I don't have love of this world when I've never been given any of it? Right, so if I'm poor, can I be like, oh, I hate the dunya, and, uh, you know what I mean? I, I, don't, I don't have that luxury. Why? Because I don't even have what? I don't have access to it. I don't have the means to it. So I can't claim that I have no love for this world when I don't even have access to it. Versus somebody who's rich, then they can actually make that claim. And they can actually say, no, I don't really have a desire for these things. Yeah. I'm sorry, yeah, yeah. There's, there's no wrong meaning there. Um, so this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he, who does he test? Does he test those who he loves or those who he hates? Right, he, th- those who he loves most, meaning, and the people who have the greatest test are the ones who he, Azza wa Jal, loves the most. So the harder the test, the more he Azawajal loves us. And when he tests us, why does he do that? Is because he wants to increase our share in the Akhirah. So again, this, this idea of having perspective and learning how to deal with some of these issues. And he, said, he uses the example of a father. So he said sometimes a father will prevent his children from sweet fruits and he'll expose him to the pain of bloodletting and cupping. So bloodletting and wet cupping, like hijama, these two things are what? Like, you have to talk about Ghazali. Ghazali was like, he was what, 505? So, 900 years ago. I'm sorry? <laughs> it's like, man up, lose some blood. <laughs> I'm sorry? Arrest, no. <laughs> but why? why am I, what is, what is uh, significant about these two things? Keeping the timeline in mind. Uh, right, these, were, these were medicinal. Right? Why did people do this? These were remedies. Right? Why did people bloodlet? Why did people do hijama? Because they thought 
you know, you get rid of the quote unquote bad blood. Right? And this is what it means, and this was a remedy to cure illness and sickness. So over here, he's, he's using the same example that we use in modern day you know, uh, medicine. When we say, well, yes, we prevent our children from eating candy, but we make them take, take aspirin, and aspirin is very what? Bitter. Why? It's medicinal, and we care about them. And, and this, that we do it out of love. And so he's using this example that, yes, there are certain things that are tough. There are certain things that are difficult. There are some, certain things that are not tasty, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to experience them because we are loved and beloved by him. Azza wa Jalla. Make us, make Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us beloved to him. I mean. So, um, and we learn that everything that is not for, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then it is meant to be for this world. And whatever is for Allah, then it is not for this world. And that's it. This is the summary of what Imam Ghazali uh, wanted to share concerning this. What are some benefits that we can take away from this? And what are some understandings? And saying that, then is it not okay to have nice things? I cannot have nice things. I can. I should have nice things. Okay. How did you get that from, from, from the discussion? Uh, okay. Don't, don't, let those, don't let those things control me. Okay. Good. Why does it got to be a Tesla? <laughs> huh? I know. The Lucid? Okay. Oh, so can I have nice things or no? Why? Prove it to me. Are there blessings? When? Ah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Allahu Akbar. Well, that's, that, that's a different argument. D does it actually save the environment or not? But that, that's, more, that's, that's more a political discussion. Right? I'm sorry? Only use it to drive to the masjid. Allahu Akbar. I have a dedicated Tesla <laughs> to take me to the masjid out of my seven cars. Out of my seven cars. I'm sorry? Allahu Akbar. <laughs> Every time the tire roll, right? Every turn of the tire. So, but that's, I mean, and you guys have a good understanding of this, right? Ghazali, he, he makes that point very subtly when he says that in order for me to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to my fullest, I need to be what? I need to be well, right? And, and that wellness is going to manifest itself in different ways. And not just that, it's going to be very subjective, right? What, what works for me is not necessarily that it'll work for the next person. People have different families, people have different backgrounds, people have different understandings, and we have to keep all of those things in mind. So essentially, like I said, he's not saying to, you know, um, you, you have to get rid of the dunya every opportunity that you get. He's saying keep the dunya in what? In perspective. And Allah knows best. Any questions? What do you think, based on what we took? Sure, I mean, is it permissible? Absol absolutely. If it becomes a means only. Otherwise, it increases your what? Your accountability. Yes, Tfadla. Sure. It depends on your, per it, yeah. You sure. Yeah, yeah. No, so, yeah. If you understand it incorrectly. Because we have to understand that all of the discussion we've had is cumulative, right? So this is just one part of a very large discussion. And one of those discussions is like, as long as I'm using it as a means to draw near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one example of that is I'm opening a business. For example, I'm opening a business or I'm opening a factory. How can I, how can I correct my intention? How? You mean, how, I want to open up a factory. I'm sorry? I'm doing it for the sake of Allah. Sure, how? Okay, I can produce things that can help people, possibly. I'm employing Muslims. Yes, I'm employing Muslims and I'm helping them 
attain their sustenance. Is that not a good attention? And have I not scaled? Okay, well, I want to I have 10 factories. I have another idea. I want to open up something else. Like, there's, capitalism is, is just an idea on monetary theory. That's all. It's a tool, just like many things that we have in our life. And if we understand it's a tool, what does that mean? It can be used for good. And if, if I want to control uncontrolled capitalism, right, which is one of the problems that we have, overconsumption, et cetera, how do I control that? What do I need to do? I need to limit my personal consumption. That's all. Because when I limit my personal consumption, a lot of people will be like, you know, in this idea, if I have a lot of money and I'm, limit, and I'm living comfortably, accordingly, within my means, and I have all this extra money, what am I going to do with it? I can donate some of it, sure. The reality is people don't donate all their wealth, right? Unless it's like an emergency situation. I'm sorry? I'm going to invest it. And when I invest money, what happens to it? The, well, not just more money. You're looking at it from my perspective. I'm talking about, let's look at it from the economy's perspective. So, I'm producing. And when I'm producing, so for, and, and I'll just give a simple example of this. When I go to buy a TV, what happens? To buy a television. Right? So now the people who worked in the factory, it'll keep them in production, it'll keep them going. The person who's selling the television, right? The person who's selling the television, he's getting a commission. The business that is hosting that, right? They're, they're getting some income from that. Like the guy who's delivering it. Like, so you're talking about like there's an entire chain of people who are benefiting from this process. And it's not a problem to put money, like we should put money into the economy. There's no doubt about that. Even zakat, you know who, who has to give zakat? People who don't contribute to the economy. Think about that. This is money that I haven't contributed to the economy. Those are the people that give zakat. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, yeah, there's, it's, it is skewed and there's a lot of government involvement, I agree. Yes, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the moment you use it as a means, it's no longer there. It's not. Indulgence is when you don't do it for the sake of Allah. It's like, I want to have seven cars because I enjoy cars. And he's saying that, what is he essentially saying? If I, if I buy seven cars, that's what? What is the ruling? Is it haram or halal? I can assume, I can, let's say I can afford it, I give zakat, I'm taking care of my family, and I, have, and I buy seven cars. It, it's, it's halal. But he's, but essentially it's still what? Right, it's, it's still indulgence. And Ghazali, he's not saying I'm not doing anything haram. But what happens when I stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Right, there's more accountability. I have more responsibility. I've increased my accountability. And it's very possible because I was spending more time in these things that my status in front of him is going to what? Drop. So is, is he saying that this person is in the hellfire? Like, oh, you can't do that. You're in the hellfire. No, no. He's saying like, listen, just be aware. That there's a risk associated whenever you indulge, even in halal things. Make sense? Any other questions? Further, huh? When is the what? Oh, the risk? The risk that you get a lower status in Jannah. Any other questions? After class. Right.